morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I'd like to welcome every, everybody to the first of our new series of webcasts called WAS Talks. And we're very delighted by the uh, enthusiastic response we've gotten to this recent mailing announcing this program. I'd like to just give you a little background on this meeting. Uh, and then turn it over to Donato, our moderator, to introduce our very distinguished speaker and, uh, and group of panelists. panelists. Uh, I think as most of you know, last year under the Global Leadership Project, which we've been doing in collaboration with uh, David Chikvaidze and uh, the UN office at Geneva, uh, we conducted not only two major conferences, but also about 15 webinars looking at specific issues related to global leadership, particularly looking for catalytic strategies for a breakthrough. And though we covered a great deal of territory in those meetings, we found that uh, we raised many more questions and opportunities than we could deal with in the time available. And so we decided to launch this series uh, this year. Uh, and the first of these meetings has been prompted by three proposals which were submitted to the Academy by our fellow Andreas Bommel uh, from Democracy Without Borders, uh, which we'll be discussing today, very exciting proposals. And the Academy board discussed those proposals and examined them and felt that it would really like to hear from a wider group of our own fellows uh, as to for feedback on this, that it required more discussion than we could do justice to at the board meeting. And so we decided to make this the first of our WAS talks. We realized even this event cannot do justice to the seriousness and depth of the issues before us. And so at the end of the session, we'll be circulating a survey which we request you to take five minutes to fill out, sharing your thoughts on what further steps we may take to explore and discuss these issues in more detail, as well as inviting your ideas about what you would like to see in future WAS talks as we proceed. So with that, I'd like to welcome you all uh, and look forward to a wonderful pro program today. And Donato, I turn it over to you. Welcome to the Wall Talks. This is the first appointment in a series, in a long series, we hope. And uh, the first uh, item on the agenda is democratizing the global governance. Uh, the uh, speakers that we have is a presenter, a presenter meaning uh, um, our friend, uh, fellow, as all fellows, uh, Andreas Bummel, who will present uh, three proposals, as Gary Jacobs was mentioning. And the three proposals relate to the UN uh, Parliament, a UN Parliament that could be created, uh, a um, Voice of the People initiative, uh, it's called UN Citizens, and a third one that is devoted to a possible special envoy position for um, citizenship, for uh, for for. Uh, uh, the civil society to be directly represented, to be heard. So these three initiatives concur to uh, the uh, a, a one single proposal uh, to democratize the UN system, to democratize um, the UN um, proceedings and to make uh, people heard, to make the voice of people heard. We have uh, three uh, discussions, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, um, she is a politician, a diplomat, uh, and former president of the General Assembly of the United Nations, David Chigweise, uh, who is uh, also a senior analyst, a senior policy analyst, and chef de cabinet at the United Nations in Geneva, and Jonathan Granov, uh, who is the president of the Global Security Institute. They will be the three discussions around uh, the three proposals uh, and the unicum that, that this proposal represents uh, to give people, uh, people of the world a voice in UN proceedings, to make them heard, uh, to have more of uh, a role for uh, civil society. 
Of course, it's, it won't be easy to have 8 billion people being represented at once, but I know that these proposals have a long history, that many other proposals are being discussed. So, Andreas, let's start with you. As we said, give us a briefing, a succinct briefing of where the initiatives stand and what do these initiatives imply. Andreas, to you. Well, thank you very much, dear Gary, first of all, for the invitation and dear Donato for the introduction. It's a big pleasure and honor indeed for me to speak at this virtual panel today on democratizing global governance. I recall that we have discussed these issues way back in Baku and Podgorica, so I'm, I'm really happy that we are um, keeping this thread in focus. And um, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to summarize it all in 10 minutes, which is my goal, 10 minutes. So let me start right away um, by saying that Democracy Without Borders, together with Democracy International and Civicus, um, we, have, we plan to launch a joint statement on inclusive and democratic global governments later this month. And um, this webcast is a perfect opportunity to explore the use within the World Academy, which has been invited to be part of this upcoming campaign. Um, specifically, as has been already said by um, both introducers, the statement calls for the instrument of the UN World Citizens Initiative, for a UN Parliamentary Assembly, and for creating the office of a UN Civil Society Envoy. Um, we are, of course, aware that there are numerous other important proposals in this field. So there is no intention to say this is exhaustive. Nonetheless, we believe that focus is necessary, especially in this field, if we actually want to achieve political impact and if we want these instruments to actually be implemented. So if implemented, we believe that these three proposals would help spark a transformational potential at the UN. So we are looking at them as engines. We want them to become engines inside the system that would move forward further change. And then other proposals would come on the agenda. And with the help of these three institutions or instruments, we hope that there would be real forward momentum, which let's be honest is lacking. In, at the UN. So having said that, let's look at the proposals. Really not a lot of time. First, the World Citizens Initiative. The proposed World Citizens Initiative would be a formal UN instrument for citizen participation and consultation. This means that citizens would be able to register their own proposals and such proposals that get sufficient signatures globally and across world regions would be put on the agenda either of the UN General Assembly or of the UN Security Council, depending on, on their substance. And ideally during the annual high level week at the beginning of each UN General Assembly in September. So the idea is really that heads of state and government would have to listen to these proposed initiatives and the General Assembly or the Security Council, depending, would then have to react Formally, there would be three stages. First, registration of proposals by citizen committees. Second, collection of support. And third, is the submission of proposals, formal submission, and a response by the UN, uh, ideally a vote uh, by one of the bodies concerned. The proposal is really based on the example of the European Citizens Initiative, which is already in existence since the Lisbon Treaty. So that's not sky in the pie in the sky thinking, but we have this real instrument um, that we can use as an example at the EU level. And here it is the case that um, 1 million signatures can be collected and then the EU commission would have to look at the proposal and um, ideally it would enact or depending on, um, on its own discretion, it would enact legislation or not, but it would be connected with public hearings and, and that sort of activities. In terms of the World Citizens Initiative, it has been suggested that a total number of 5 million signatures should be necessary to be collected within 18 months um, after registering an initiative for it to qualify. And um, this also not only um, 
um, involves 5 million total signatures, but those would also have to come from a representative group of member states across world regions. So it's not possible that um, a World Citizens Initiative would be supported by, I don't know, 5 million people from a single country, and then it would qualify. That's not the case. So a lot more to be said about this, but we need to move on. And I guess we will talk about details more in the discussion. So the second proposal is the UN Parliamentary Assembly. Um, it's been voiced for the first time in 1949. Albert Einstein has been a supporter. There's a long history. Uh, 15 years ago, the late former UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali encouraged us to launch a campaign on this subject. And this campaign is still ongoing and would then become part of this um, more coherent um, um, statement and campaign that is based on free items. While the implementation of a parliamentary assembly is quite complex at the level of detail, the basic idea is very simple. And that's while, while the UN collaborates with parliaments and parliamentarians, there's no formal UN body that gives them any role. So the UNPA would allow elected representatives from the parliaments of member states to have a seat and a voice and representation at the UN would thus go beyond merely the executive branches of member states. And those, this is, this is critical, those member states who wish to do so, they could even introduce direct elections of their representatives at some point, but it should be, um, possible, they're optional for them to do that. A key feature of the assembly should be that delegates group according to their political views and not according to the country of origin or geopolitical groups, like it is usually the case at the UN and other, by the way, other international parliamentary institutions. Beyond its own membership, the UN, UN parliamentary assembly itself would be a new additional tool that connect citizens and civil society to the UN, apart from the citizens um, initiative and the civil society envoy. It would be its own platform for engagement through its representatives, its committees, subcommittees, and so on. Um, over time, the UNPA has received substantial support, for instance, from over 1,600 members of parliament um, while we've been running the campaign. And it is also very important to note that the World Citizens Initiative and the UN Parliamentary Assembly both could be created by the General Assembly using Article 22 of the UN Charter. So no cumbersome change of the Charter initially would be required, which is virtually impossible, more or less. Now the third proposal, I'm trying to keep my 10 minutes. It's a challenge as I was anticipating. So concerning the third proposal, it is argued that a civil society champion at the UN Secretariat would increase the UN's now limited capacity to engage proactively with civil society. There are, of course, a number of um, instruments that UN and institutions, the UN system have implemented to engage with civil society. But proponents of the civil society envoy office say that this would actually allow for the improvement of these processes in a coherent um, way from a bird's view perspective. Um, since these existing processes vary greatly across the UN system from entity to entity, from country to country, and sometimes even from event to event. So the office, that's the idea, would perform an assessment of best practices, best practices, inconsistencies that exist and roadblocks with a view of improving standards and simplifying processes. Most importantly, it is pointed out that a civil society envoy would allow the UN to hear also from a broader and more diverse and more representative cross-section of civil society by proactively seeking out their views through field visits and consultations. At this time, it is the large and well-resourced organizations that can afford to run offices in New York, Geneva, and other places um, to have access to UN consultations. So the envoy office could be created by this, in principle could be created by the secretary general of the UN without any formal word of a general assembly. 
um, except if he would want it to be funded by the UN through um, regular funds, regular contributions. In this case, General Assembly approval, of course, is necessary and politically it might be necessary anyway. At the moment, there seems to be a consensus in civil society that the post should be funded from voluntary contributions. So I'm coming to my final remarks. We know very well that these are difficult times. Civil society space and democracy are under pressure in many countries and there are autocratic governments that simply do not accept any different views or criticism. That's a reality. Um, they do not accept this at home and they do not want this at the UN either. So that's something we need to deal with. But from our point of view, the right reaction is not to retreat, but quite the contrary, to insist on our demands for more participation and better democratic representation at the UN. Windows of opportunity will come and we need to have, you know, keep these, these agenda points alive and push them towards implementation. We are actually reacting to the um, UN 75 consultation that was carried out in the past year. Um, and we are responding to the UN 75 high level declaration that was adopted in September. The path, path towards this resolution was paved in the General Assembly under the presidency of Maria Espinosa. And it's a privilege to have her here as the commenter uh, just in a minute. Um, and I would like to point out that in the UN 75 public consultations, the UN Parliamentary Assembly and the World Citizens Initiative were among the proposals most frequently identified by participants in the area of renewing the UN. And that has been acknowledged by the UN itself in its official UN 75 report. And we believe that this requires a follow up by the Secretary General who has been tasked to present a report on the common agenda included or identified in the high level declaration adopted in September. So our response and our demand really in the joint statement is that these three items should be evaluated by member states and the UN. Um, they, are, they have different levels of ambition, obviously. The civil society envoy is something that might be implemented rather quickly um, if sufficient political and support and funding exists. But the other two proposals are also, in our view, um, urgent and need to be put on the agenda as well. So, um, so far, so good. Um, I think there are a lot of questions probably that will be addressed and I'm looking forward to it. Um, maybe I just mention also that um, the free proposal are also included in the civil society declaration and plan of action um, on UN 75 that was adopted last year. So those proposals have actually a, a track record already of strong civil society support. And um, finally, I hope that the World Academy will decide to endorse this campaign and promote it proactively because the Academy and its members, you, you can make a big difference in making this a reality. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Andreas. Andreas Bummel, Director, Democracy Without Border, who is uh, the champion of these three initiatives that are joined together, that they can also be taken separately, as he uh, proposed. They have an history of their own, an history that traces back from the foundations of the United Nations itself. As we heard, you know, we the people, the people that want to have a say, they were supposed to have a say uh, as peoples of the world, not just as nations. So now we have to see if these ideas, Andreas, that you are cultivating for so much time uh, are really viable. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, they are viable in your views, but we want to hear it from people that, uh, that, that chew these kind of issues every day. And who best than Maria Fernanda Espinosa, former president of the General Assembly, can give us a hint on where we do stand with these three proposals uh, and uh, what other proposals are being discussed along the same vein in terms of democratizing UN institutions, make them more accessible to the people of the world. Maria, thank you. You are the first. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Donato, and, and greetings uh, to all of us fellows and friends. And of course, 
Thank you so much to Andreas for a, a very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, you know, these are big ideas, um, and uh, I, and I think that they they really need um, wide consideration and 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 discussions, uh, uh, several discussions. And uh, I think that this issue is extremely uh, relevant and in in timely. Uh, you recall very well, uh, Andreas, that um, the 75th anniversary, uh, believe me, when uh, I had, you know, the, the idea of, of unleashing a process, I didn't, I wasn't expecting something so big, you know, you, uh, to, to start a, a global conversation, very dynamic about the future of the United Nations. Oh, first, I forgot to ask you, Donato, um, how much time I have so I can go to the point or, you know. Maria, you, you have about five minutes, but then we will oh. take rounds because this is really a debate. We don't want to have long statements. Uh, it's debate among experts. It's a sort of peer review in a, in a sense because uh, okay. Andreas has offered us wonderful ideas to debate. And uh, we will uh, we will come in turn. So please go on. I will interrupt you if I if I see that you over <laughs> that you have. Yes, please this. do. Please do please interrupt me, please. So well, basically, what I was, go I was going to say is that this uh, global conversation uh, uh, about the future of the UN uh, basically uh, gave. Um, uh, incredible results, countless proposals, ideas, uh, new formulas are on the table. Um, starting by the very ambitious and forward-looking People's Declaration, uh, carefully crafted by a civil society coalition, as you know, the UN 2020, and literally hundreds of proposals by the Global Governance Forum think tanks, youth organizations, academia. In, uh, you know, I'm very happy that I, I was able to take part of all this movement worldwide. And I think that uh, we have to recall that uh, during the UN 75 dialogues and consultations, uh, there was this survey that I always like to refer to, 1.5 million respondents. The message from the world survey was cl crystal clear. The UN has made the world a better place, no doubt. It is irreplaceable, no doubt. And yet, it needs to be retooled, rejuvenated, uh, to uh, respond uh, to the new challenges, to a completely new political scenario. We are not living in the post-Second World War times anymore. So um, basically, the, 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 the consultations found that you know, amidst the current crisis, the immediate priority, for example, of most respondents everywhere is improved access to ba uh, basic services, uh, health care, safe water and sanitation, uh, quality education. And increasingly, uh, the second main priority is greater international solidarity and increased support to the places hardest hit by the current COVID-19 pandemic. So um, basically we had, I think, uh, close to 90%, 87% of those surveyed believe that the international cooperation is vital to deal with today's challenges. And the majority of respondents believe that the COVID-19 crisis made international cooperation even more urgent. So this is the context, but because sometimes uh, we say, what are the formulas, you know, the three options that uh, Andres so eloquently presented, but what is the main objective? Why is that we want that? And uh, we often say, yes, it is to democratize the UN, but uh, you know, Yes, indeed, we need to democratize we, we, the UN. We need uh, to um, include the voices of civil society in the intergovernmental decision-making processes. Uh, and, and I think this is uh, what it's all about. But perhaps I would like to briefly, you know, uh, uh, contribute with three ideas. The number one is um, if this is going to contribute uh, to uh, close uh, the trust deficit uh, on political institutions um, 
since uh, I would say the financial crisis of 2008. So to democratize our multilateral system, it is central, central to overcome the trust deficit in institutions and international law. And let's only look at what is happening with the immunization efforts worldwide as we speak. Um, where are the foundational principles of the UN Charter? Cooperation, solidarity. Uh, where is, you know, how is that we are processing the dictum, no one is safe until everybody's safe? What has happened with our international architecture? Anxiety, mistrust, fear are the qualifiers of our times. And, and let's also look at the implementation and usefulness of the several UNGA resolutions and Security Council resolutions uh, um, ECOSOC uh, on, uh, on COVID. Uh, have these resolutions, have them made the situation better? And this is the, the, a critical question. So, and I don't want, I have some numbers here, but perhaps for later in the conversation, you know, the uh, Edelman, uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer, it has, you know, information that, you know, that we have to worry about. Uh, so I, I think that um, we all understand the need for uh, the reform and democratization of the UN. In uh, and, and one, of course, you cannot have one without the other. We have uh, to make sure that we deliver on the ongoing reform process, the three pillar reform process of the UN on the management side, on the peace and security pillar, and also on the new development art architecture. So this is one of the, of the pending uh, uh, homeworks that we have uh, uh, internally. And on that, I think that we are moving in a context of global recession, increasing inequalities, a growing nationalistic and unilateral tendencies uh, you know, so we, we have to take all these into account. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it is important, it, it is critical to make sure that we have a predictable uh, built-in mechanism uh, to ensure the participation of civil society. The three proposals, of course, uh, have different levels of difficulty and different challenges. No, I think that um, uh, there is a, a little bit of homework to do in the sense of not only of the content on the very carefully designed content, but on the strategy and on the tactics. How is that we are going to make it happen? It is obvious that uh, there is a, a, a need to have a group of friends, uh, something, from the government side, because the UN is still an intergovernmental body. So we do need a, a closer dialogue with, with member states. And I will simply close with, with perhaps uh, three takeaways. The quick, uh, the first uh, question here is, you know, the purpose is how to bring the UN closer to the people. And the motto of my president uh, presidency was, how to make the U UN relevant to, uh, to all, to make the UN accountable. And that is our purpose. But at the same time, we need to reflect on what is civil society? What are the voices of civil society that we want to bring in, you know, to inform and support the decision-making processes at the UN? This is critical, you know, when we are finding means and structures to equalize power at the international level and democratize multilateralism. Civil society cannot be seen as a monolithic inter, uh, independent corpus. Uh, there are indeed interests, different worldviews, levels of representation, sectoral commitments, financial links from civil society for groups A or B. And I think this has to be carefully considered when we imagine, you know, the three options that are on the table. And number three, uh, as I mentioned before, what is the strategy and the tactics, uh, the tactics for, for the three ideas? How to go from description and prescription to political strategy. This is critical as we go uh, forward uh, with, with uh, these ideas. And happy to jump in afterwards in a 
uh, if we have the opportunity for a second round. Uh, thank you, Donato, and, and, and back to you. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Of course, you will have more than a chance. Uh, the debate continues. Andreas, I'm sure you made good note of the observations you received from Maria Fernanda. Uh, in particular, I think that she referred to strategies and tactics. And that would be certainly an area that we would like to hear from you. Where do you stand? Have you a group of friends of your initiatives in place? Uh, that would be uh, an advice that Maria Fernanda Espinoza has given you. Probably that this exists. If it doesn't exist, what do you plan to do in the months or years to come? I hope in the months to come or days to come. But now let's go to David Chivaitze. Uh, David, uh, up to you to comment these three initiatives uh, that are all brilliant. As, as we know, they're all uh, great initiatives to give people a voice in the UN system. Uh, this UN reform is much needed and we are asked to come up with uh, good ideas from, from the United Nations system itself. We have been involved in the UN 75th anniversary dialogue as World Academy of Art and Science. So this particular session of uh, WAS of World Academy Talks is dedicated to uh, international governance and the ideas that Andreas Bommel and Democracy Without Border, Border has put forward. What do you think in, in this uh, vein? What do you think is feasible? What could be done to go ahead with these initiatives? David. I plead the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Thank you, Donato. Um, let, me, let me start by uh, asking a, what may sound like a rhetorical question, but the theme of this talk is uh, democratizing global governance. One would assume that we have global governance, that we are democratizing or we won't wish to democratize. Which global governance are we talking about? The, the world is in an absolute uh, tailspin. It's been moving uh, to something it doesn't know what the past 30 years. And we still don't know where it's gonna wind up. So what are we democrat, democrat, democratizing? Anyway, you know what I mean. So that's, that's a question that we need to put. If you say democratize the multilateral system Okay, that's getting closer to it. If we say democratize the UN, which uh, we have come down to this uh, terminology, that is a, a technical issue. Um, and uh, it, it's absolutely obvious that um, the United Nations needs to hear civil society's voice much more than it is hearing now. There are mechanisms. And civil society does uh, have a hearing, but not everywhere and not at the level that it should. And I, uh, I fully uh, subscribe to Andreas's um, you know, theoretical uh, postulations how that could be done. Indeed, if it could be done, it would be a great um, contribution to the richness of the discussion, to bringing uh, to the fore the, uh, the issues that come from the grassroots, um, bearing in mind what Maria Fernanda uh, said, that we need to also, in the process, define what is civil society and which civil society, because uh, we need to have the real McCoy. We don't want somebody's interests uh, dressed up as uh, civil society uh, whether it's commercial interests or political interests, etc. So this is not a black and white, good and bad, you know, uh, the, the bad multilateral system and we have the good civil society and we need to, uh, this is a very complex matter, as is the complex, the three, each of the three suggestions uh, that Andrin has put forth. Again, I want to uh, underline and underscore that all three of them are terrific if they could be implemented uh, well and correctly. Now, I don't wanna be a, a, a party pooper uh, by any uh, consideration, but I would like to um, sort of uh, mention some of the things that I think 
could be obstacles. They would be uh, obstacles that we could overcome or you know, some quicker, some uh, slower. But my, my first uh, problem with all three, uh, and that's mine, I'm, you know, uh, is that each of them in one way or another presuppose the creation of some sort of addendum to the bureaucracy. And that to me is problematic, whether it's the World Citizens Committee. So uh, how do we uh, go about this? Okay, Andreas answered the question. It's, uh, it's not uh, uh, you know, from one place, et cetera, 5 million signatures in 18 months broken down, what, by region? Will there be quotas? Who's going to be uh, the organization that is going to be uh, doing the tallies? Uh, which ideas will be, you know, which signatures will be, who's going to check the signatures? Is it with IDs? I mean, it's a, it's a whole, uh, you know, uh, the devil is in the details in every one of these. Again, it will be terrific. Uh, then you have to consider uh, whether the General Assembly um, uh, agenda, annotated agenda, when we see it, it's already overcharged to, to such an extent, and Maria Fernanda can uh, confirm how unwieldy it is. Uh, so we would have to, you know, some issues would need to be superseded. They could be grouped, they could be superseded under the ideas brought in by this uh, World Citizens Committee initiative, but it, it's going to be a big... <laughs> a big chunk of the General Assembly and Conference Management Division is going to have its hands full to implement this uh, very laudable idea. I don't want to uh, you know, talk only about one. UN Parliamentary Assembly. It's obvious that it is uh, you know, also a terrific idea because the parliaments are the ones who represent the people and the parliaments are the ones that <laughs> vote the money. Uh, that dispose of the taxpayers' money in each country, and then you know um, approve or not approve the budgets of the international organizations. However, um, if I was wondering, and then uh, how this would be organized, but then uh, Andreas clarified there would be by views. So immediately, you know, the the People's Party in the European Parliament jumps to mind. So you're going to have all these uh, all these lobbyists, uh, and you know. Um, so we're actually bringing in uh, through this the the bureaucratic infighting of of parliamentarians in countries. We're bringing in to the uh, Parliament of Man, uh, which is the General Assembly. So I'm not, you know, I haven't had the honor of of presiding over the General Assembly, but I find that to be uh, really, that needs needs uh, further work. Special envoy is a, is an excellent idea. It seems to be uh, the the lowest hanging fruit of the three. Uh, however, uh, I am not so sure that uh, that uh, Andreas's uh, impression that the SG can create this on his own is going to fly. I don't think so. Uh, the SG can't hire and fire a G five. Uh, so uh, something like this will need to go to the ACABQ, to the fifth committee, and that's only on the financial side, because if you have a special envoy, that obviously will have to be uh, an undersecretary general level, which is, uh, you know, if you have uh, for one dollar a year, it's going to be less clout, most certainly. But then the other issue is the political issue. Uh, who is going to approve this? Member states will be looking at this with a very fine tooth comb because the first question they're going to ask, what is the role? And who, how does this one person with an office represent the civil society writ large uh, all over the world? There has to be a mechanism. We have a special representative or whatever uh, the, the correct title is for youth, fine. But youth, uh, the entire youth of the world 
haven't appointed this person. You appoint a person like that, and then that person goes out creating work, looking for work, bringing in, you know, and that's fine. But then you have to have a docking mechanism because the idea of a special envoy is, uh, is very important uh, and productive only if that special envoy is uh, received and well uh, welcomed by, by the uh, variety of uh, organs of the UN, auxiliary, uh, standing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that would need quite a large uh, staff. I don't mean to sound like a died in the wolves bureaucrat, but um, which I probably am. Uh, I'm very receptive to new ideas, but I'm not, um, you know, I prefer to be honest and give my honest views because uh, I've been to this barbecue before. Uh, and uh, I know how hard it is to get you know, uh, for an undersecretary general here, director general of the UN office of Geneva, can't make a simple decision without referring to New York. Okay, uh, this is how it's organized. And the last point, uh, whenever somebody you says the last point. In, 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 in a, in a Sorry? Second. You will have more time to go more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, last point I want to make is uh, I think civil society needs to, uh, civil society writ large, however you want to slice it, the best road is to apply as much pressure and as much uh, uh, interaction in their own governments to make the governments listen. You know, write to your congressman. That's the, the basic approach. I would leave it at that and maybe rebound on a few things. Uh, Andres, I'm sorry if I uh, shot bullet holes through it, but I used to work for James Baker who would come up with a plan and then hold it up and say, shoot bullet holes in my plane. So that's what I did. <laughs> it, it was very constructive. I'm sure that this is the way Andreas uh, felt it. I mean, we, we all are giving our, our best in terms of uh, thinking of what uh, can be done to support the terrific ideas that Andreas Bumale is putting forward. On the other hand, we have to see the practicalities, as you said. And I know that Andreas is uh, making note of the remarks he heard, and he will come back to us. Let's now go for five minutes, Jonathan, five minutes up to you to be as stringent as possible. You are a champion yourself of civil society, so probably you are very favorable of these uh, initiatives. Uh, up to you to tell us what you think and how to go about it. Thank you very much. Well, um, and thank you, Andreas, for, 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 pushing, for pushing for greater accountability at a global level. You know, it's interesting that it is, in the discussions of the Sustainable Development Goals, Sustainable go uh, Goal number 16 talks about accountability of all levels of government. And uh, there's very rarely a discussion about the accountability of governments to uh, the rule of law at an international level. And I would just go first and foremost to one of the steps that I think we need to take to move in the direction of greater civic responsibility is found in the existing charter. We already have a statement in the charter that would address one of the great challenges of our day, which is sustainable development. And it is found in chapter five, article 26 of the charter, which explicitly tasks the Security Council to convene the military staff committees to reduce our expenditures on armaments and free up resources for social development. And one of the aspects of social development, I believe, is greater civic participation in the institution of the UN. But while people are just trying to survive, just trying to have enough to eat, just trying to be healthy, the idea of civic participation in governance is pretty low on their scale. So first and foremost, I think we need to be talking about the fundamental values of governance, governance for whom and for what. So I was involved with Mikhail Gorbachev, Jane Goodall, and uh, Jonathan Schell 
in responding to an essay by Senator Alan Cranston, who was the first president of the World Federalists, called, and the book is called The Sovereignty Revolution, published by Stanford University Press. And we went right at this issue, which is, is the authority of governance uh, at any level from the top down, from some metaphysical bestowal of power on the institution of gov government, or does it derive its authority from those who are governed, those who are impacted by those institutions? And we argued that having greater global governance and greater global participation by the citizenry of the world is not a derogation of sovereignty, but an expression of the values that create sovereignty. So for example, in my neighborhood, there's a zoning board that, that says what, you, what kind of houses people can build in this neighborhood. Then there's a city government. The zoning board is not in derogation of the city government, nor vice versa. And then there's a state government of the state of New Jersey. And then the state of New Jersey is part of a federal government. And each of these layers addresses certain problems. Conceptually today, there's a set of existential problems that humanity as a whole faces that cannot be resolved at the national governance level the climate, the health of the oceans, poverty, public health, pandemic diseases, nuclear weapons. All of these issues affect every human being on the planet. And yet the human beings on the planet don't have political agency in addressing them. The institutions that have agency are only states. So anything that can create greater empowerment of the human being is consistent with the values inherent in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a value statement, and the practical necessity of a constituency globally to address these global problems. And for that reason, I think these are good ideas. But I wanna just highlight where we are right now. Where we are right now is the entire budget of the UN is less than $35 billion a year. And that, that's a very, that includes everything, peacekeeping, everything. The world spent $1.9 trillion on pursuing international peace and security through military means. And my country being the most flagrant, uh, you know, setting the pace for this madness. The, Budget in the United States alone for police, in the US alone for police, is around 100 billion. The city of New York's police budget's around 11 billion a year. You just get an idea. The US spends 80 billion on incarcerating people. So right away we're looking at, you know, if, you, if, if money is an expression of values, which it is, we need to have a serious debate on values. So I'm going to just propose a couple of interim steps that will help move the debate. One is, unambiguously, we need Security Council reform. The Security Council represents a world that doesn't exist today. We need, we need more permanent members, maybe not necessarily with the veto power, but we, there's no permanent member from Latin America. There's no permanent member from Africa. This is preposterous. It's, this is the, the huge portions of the world are not represented on the Security Council. Um, we need to strengthen the international legal institutions, the International Court of Justice should have compulsory jurisdiction and not just advisory opinions, but actually be able to resolve disputes. We need, we need to strengthen the International Criminal Court. We need a, we need a court to address environmental degradation the, now, I'm just going to finish and say, well, people talk about the impossibility of, well, the impossibility of global governance, but the, but the, but the, but the uh, financial community and the commercial community of the world actually have created in the post-Cold War a very effective global governance system, if we see as one of the pillars of governance, third-party adjudication of disputes. And they've done it through the arbitration system. In, if you go back 70 years ago, or even less than that, even just right before the end of the Cold War, if you had a judgment 
from a court in Canada to try and enforce it in the United States or a judgment in Kazakhstan tried to enforce it in China. It would be, it's very difficult to enforce them. The local courts would open up the judgment and then you have to litigate the whole matter, which made global, global, globalization very difficult. What has happened is the business community has created an arbitration system in which parties engaged in, in commercial enterprises or financial enterprises choose to have any disputes resolved by an arbitration process. This has allowed a letter of credit in Kuala Lumpur to be confidently honored in Chile, in, 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 Chile, in New York, anywhere. So what has happened is the capacity of the business community to impact the environment of the climate, the environment of the health of the oceans, to impact the world, the natural world, biodiversity, et cetera, has been amplified by the expanded impact of, of science and technology in service of commerce without any governmental Demo de democratic oversight. So we have this process of globalization, a process of governance by the commercial world, but there's no commensurate institutions to protect human rights, to protect the individual sanctity, to protect the environment. There's no international judicial oversight process or governance, but we have governance only in the service of commerce. And Jonathan, then we have, thank you very I'll much. finish. Then we have outside of governance. We have to move on because the we debate have... needs to continue. Okay. Uh, we skip it for the, the second round because we want to have a second round. But uh, first of all, I want to tell you that we have over 70 participants online, uh, very uh, important uh, fellows and specialists in this field who are also asking for the floor. We will try at the end to give the floor to three, two or three of them because they have very interesting questions for, for all of you. Andreas, would you like to react? Uh, unfortunately, five minutes because we would like really to have more of a debate with all of you. Uh, just pick up the salient points that you heard from the three uh, um, speakers of the three panelists and uh, just tell us what we where we have to go from now. All right, thank you very much for these very um, productive and interesting and enlightening reactions and um, well it is true it's not possible to address all those um, important items that have been raised so by necessity I will have to pick um, some of them um, but before I do so let me just point out that on the free proposals, and that's one of the reasons why they have been chosen um, for this statement, there is um, literature and studies that exist that have been looking um, into how they could be implemented at the very level of um, formal details. So um, I guess our discussion can also be informed by those studies. Um, but let me now pick these, these few issues. Uh, first of all, I think it is really true that, of course, the theoretical um, you know, approach and insight is not enough. We need a, a viable political um, and practical strategy. And Maria Espinoza was quite right, in my opinion, pointing out that the a, a crucial step is having a group of friends, a group of friends of member states um, that is picking up one or more of these proposals under the theme of democratizing the UN. And that is perhaps a response to David. I think um, we cannot delve more into the question of what is global governance and how effective it is, but I can avoid that whole debate by, by saying and agreeing, well, these, these instruments, they relate to the UN, right? Um, they have a broader um, relevance, certainly, but first of all, formally, they relate to the UN. And the situation is that members, no single member state alone would wish to come out of the closet endorsing a UN Parliamentary Assembly or World Citizens Initiative. There are already 50, I, I am aware, that have um, spoken in favor of a civil society envoy. So that's a different story. There is already a large 
momentum um, at member states. But on the UN Parliamentary Assembly and the Citizens Initiative both, I think we need to create that one moment when a couple of credible member states at the same time um, recognize this is something, a win-win for them and for the UN, which I believe is true, and that they together would start a process. We have had single government representatives in the past at times who said, yes, we would like to endorse it, but we won't do it alone. So you tell me who is on board as well. You know, they wouldn't proactively do this. So of course, to get there, what we need is political um, support from civil society and parliamentarians, um, from forces, from social movements. So it actually comes on the agenda. And most governments and member states, they haven't even considered any of this. They have no position. They are buried by day-to-day -day immediate problems. They have no time dealing with the UN Parliamentary Assembly. So we need to convince them through political clout to do it. And the statement at hand is one instrument to achieve that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I won't make five minutes. Um, so in terms of what David uh, pointed out, I think it is true. The devil is in the details because I can imagine lots of con you know, conceptual approaches, for instance, towards the UN Parliamentary Assembly that we would not support. So it really depends on how exactly it is conceptualized, how seats are allocated, how the assembly would operate, um, how do we deal with undemocratic countries. So this is true. Um, we could devote a single session of a vast talk on, on how to allocate the seats in a parliamentary assembly. So thankfully, there has been research being done actually over decades that we can build on. And we think there is a, you know, we are at a point of maturity where we can, where we can actually conceptualize an assembly that, that works. Um, or at least we would hope, it, we anticipate it would work as an oversight body, as a first step. And in my initial presentation, I was avoiding to stress the long-term vision because this would add an extra layer of discussion that you've been alluding to. What is, what is the destination that we are heading to in terms of sovereignty of humanity, an issue, sovereignty, an issue that Jonathan has been pointing out? What is the destination here? And of course, I mean, at least I personally would say the destination here is a new UN, a, a UN that is substantially strengthened and that has its own funding sources um, for, for, through global taxation, let's just, you know, say it, um, global taxation, but of course, such a new UN can only be accepted if it is a world organization that is deeply rooted um, in democratic and accountable mechanisms. And, and that's where this parliamentary dimension comes in. And also where the citizens assembly of you, uh, the, the citizens instrument comes in too. Right, so the destination, the long-term destination would be a world parliament and a world constitution. But this is obviously not a matter to be discussed now. We need to at least achieve little, little baby steps. And I'm aware that for many diplomats and um, people who are inside the system, even a consultative parliamentary assembly seems like a revolution. Yes, a revolution to accept elected representatives, even give them a voice to have them speak at the UN in a formal body, it is revolutionary for them. But it is true that what Jonathan and others have pointed out here, we are in the middle of a, of a global crisis of existential proportions. And, and if that is considered a revolution, it is telling enough, you know, to just have a consultative body. Um, and. So let alone a body that is actually able to adopt binding resolutions. I mean, let just world legislation, which is where we need to go actually in the long run. Um, one item was raised concerning the World Citizens Initiative exactly. So um, let's also pay some attention to detail. Uh, it, was, it was raised um, how the, the quorum would be distributed for a proposal to qualify. And I have it here in front of me. So. I, I'll share, um, there's been a study and it was suggested there should be 5 million signatures in total at least. And then um, in addition, a, a, an initiative would qualify once it has reached at least 0.5% of signatures of the population 
of 10 UN member states coming at least five from African and Asian countries, one from Eastern European states, two from Latin American states, and two from Western Europe and other states. You can see I anticipated this question. So um, furthermore, let me quickly have a look at my notes. Um, I can only wholeheartedly agree to the um, comment by Jonathan um, that has been made um, that we really need to move towards greater accountability um, and shared sovereignty. And this is exactly the purpose, I believe, of at least the UN Parliamentary Assembly proposal um, in this statement. My five minutes are really up. Um, I think you, you managed to address most of the points. Not all, of course. This was not, it's not possible in no. uh, limited time. But you managed to represent extremely well uh, all your proposals and also to, uh, to counteract in, in terms of uh, some uh, uh, um, some observations and and some uh, and some obstacles that are foreseen in the realization of your objectives. So you have obviously a, st a strategy in mind in terms of how to go about it, and we as as World Academy are supporting that. Uh, we have, as I told you, many uh, fellows that are listening in, and I would like also to allow at least uh, three of them uh, to come in. Uh, with questions, one minute questions uh, from uh, Fadwa El Gindi, uh, from uh, Olivia Bina, and uh, from uh, Gary, Gary, uh, uh, Joseph Gary, who just asked to the floor. So I will ask Janani, our administrator, to let in uh, these three uh, fellows, or, um, or in any case, uh, uh, um, fellows or, or supporters of, of the World Academy that are following, that are attending this uh, webcast. Uh, now, let's go back to uh, the three discussants as well. Uh, Maria, uh, I, do you have further comments? And could you tell us also something about other uh, ongoing initiatives? You refer to uh, a, a resilience council that per perhaps could be also a, another a subject for another was uh, talks, but there are also other initiatives that refer, for instance, to the reform of the trusteeship council, the abolishment, obviously, of trusteeship council that is defunct, as we know, but also the possible use of that space, of that symbolic space, uh, for the uh, for a dialogue with civil society. So, do you have uh, anything else to add? Uh, at this point, while our colleagues also prepare for their questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Donato. And I think that this is a, a, a very, is a passionating um, uh, conversation. And uh, yes, indeed, I think that what we are living is a moment of, of reinvention. As the Secretary General often says, this is a reset moment. And this is uh, the moment where we need, you know, to use the opportunity to be creative, forward-looking, etc. Um, I understand uh, the, um, the the David's comments very well because the daily life of the UN is overwhelming. The agenda of the UN General Assembly it's just. Uh, almost uh, unreachable, very difficult to orchestrate and make sure that the normative role of the General Assembly uh, delivers. And, uh, and sometimes you start to wonder, during my presidency, we approved, uh, I think, 375, 76 resolutions uh, in one uh, year. And the number of agenda items of the General Assembly, I even forget, but you know, and you have to orchestrate all this and the daily life of, of, of uh, the UN is extremely demanding. My worry is how is that uh, with um, a strong voice from civil society, which I believe is uh, much needed uh, the um, choreography of the organization of, of, of the UN is going to deliver more and better, you know, for the people that we serve. Uh, you know, uh, 
in, in, in different uh, places or positions. These, these, in my opinion, are the critical questions in how also to make sure that you, uh, you know, there is no only more bureaucracy uh, to, to deal with, you know, but it is a building mechanism to ensure that the voices of civil society uh, really have an echo uh, and are brought in the decision-making processes, but not only in the decision-making processes, but also in the oversight and accountability and transparency processes. These are the questions. And, and I think, you know, the three options uh, are on the table. Uh, as we speak, um, there is this proposal on the, the creation and the establishment of a Global Resilience Council, which will follow the same path as the Human Rights Council in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the legal framework. Uh, this uh, Global Resilience Council is uh, uh, asked to uh, respond uh, and prepare and, uh, and provide normative guidance on non-armed conflict related threats to human security. And this is being, you know, discussed. If you are interested, we can, uh, you know, organize uh, with a group of people working on the proposal, a conversation with Andreas and, and with all of you uh, to bring that also to the discussion. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, the civil society component of the Global Resilience Council is still under discussion. It's, it's really not uh, um, an, uh, an already uh, made conversation. And the number two, which is uh, coming from the French government uh, recently, is the idea of a Global Pandemics Council and a Global Pandemics new convention. Um, and these are, I think, very important uh, when we think about, you know, um, um, a retool, a re rejuvenated uh, a United Nations and the United Nations uh, for the future. Uh, just to close, because I know that there are questions and people want to, to participate also, uh, but just to say that the opportunity is the report that the Secretary General has uh, to uh, present to member states in September. Uh, there are conversations, uh, ongoing conversations, uh, discussions among member states, but uh, what is obvious to me, regardless of the form uh, of the, uh, whether a UN Parliamentary Assembly, uh, whether or not a uh, global citizens a participation mechanism. What, what is true is that we do need, you know, a predictable built-in mechanism for the voices of civil society. And we, we need to find the best design to make it happen. In my experience, not only as president, but as ambassador of my country, uh, as, a, as a member of an NGO or an intergovernmental organization, uh, we cannot continue uh, uh, to establish ad hoc mechanism for particular thematic uh, requirements. Uh, I'm part of the steering committee of the Generation Equality Forum. And then th there is a whole design, which is very interesting, you know, of what we call the networked multilateralism to address uh, the future of the women's rights and the equality agenda. Uh, you know, the voices of civil society of the feminist movements uh, worldwide uh, have had a great impact in decisions that member states are taking on that regard. So perhaps we can look at the recent, very recent experience of the Generation Equality Forum just happened in Mexico and will close in June in, in Paris. Uh, not only, not, not so much about the content, but uh, about the forum and what the virtual world has allowed in terms of, uh, of this network, ample, inclusive multilateralism. I, I would just leave it there and, and sorry, Donato. That Thank I you, Maria. Think... It's fantastic, excellent. All your ideas are taken on board and we definitely would like uh, to take your offer of organizing a father was talks 
uh, on this uh, Resilience Council and other initiatives that you could uh, um, very well put together. Thank you very much, Maria. Let's go on. We have uh, three uh, participants, Fadua Elgindi, Olivia Bina, uh, and uh, uh, we had a third one that uh, now disappeared. So let's start with Fadua and Olivia, who have been selected among the many uh, fellows that are following the discussion today to come up with a short statement, one minute statement, or I mean, one minute comment or question. What do you prefer? One minute, Fadua. Let's start with you. Um, a small observation. First of all, thank you for a wonderful uh, first uh, talk. It's a wonderful series, and there are many issues that were raised by the panelists here that will be the father for following talks. Uh, the com the uh, statement by the United Nations is we the peoples, not we the people. And there is a big difference. Um, I'd like to go back to something we have talked about at WASH, and that is the identity and goals of WASH, and whether they are just signers of idealistic statements here and there, or that they are an academy that uh, problematize concepts, question um, uh, uh, processes and so on, and I'm in favor, of course, of the latter. That is, we're supposed to not accept comments like global governance without discussion, democracy. I question the notion of democracy. All the Western democracies today are being challenged by their own people. Uh, you look around uh, the net and you'll see all the publics are out in the streets against their governments. Uh, we should be uh, uh, concerned about that. And the uh, American um, capital is being invaded by the people. Uh, we, can we can dismiss it as um, uh, comments like extremism and so on, but I think there are issues being raised here. Why are so people upset with their own governments? So to go back to... Um, uh, there are nationalistic tendencies also should be questions because some nationalistic tendencies are good. Uh, they are uh, defense. They are people trying to say we have an identity and we have a, a, a sense of belonging and we don't want um, corporate business uh, marrying military interventions as in the GERD uh, Ethiopian dam to drown Egypt and starve the population of uh, 7,000 years of civilization. In other words, uh, if the people um, uh, support their government against movements like that, that shouldn't be taken as fascist, that should be taken as people seeking belonging, seeking identity, seeking uh, existential uh, saving. And so uh, we don't want to gloss over um, what was in the previous generations really a Eurocentric US dominant paradigm. And we want to look at the changing world that would make room for Africa and Asia and uh, all the, the, the issues. So um, I think uh, Maria mentioned uh, something interesting. I like everything she says, but she mentioned that we don't have wars. Where don't we have wars? It's just that wars have a different fabric now. They went underground and they are using mercenaries and they are using business. And uh, it, th there is more existential threat today than the days of the world wars. It's just that the world wars were in Europe and so they get most attention. But now it's Africa and Asia and the United States has its fingers everywhere. And so I think we should really uh, look at these concepts and uh, get away from the dominant model and subordinate nations. We're gonna help them. Thank uh, you, I, I, I think that this uh, is a, a statement, is a comment, very interesting, but we have to go on. So this is, thank you for your contribution, uh, Olivia. Up to you, really be uh, succinct. One minute. I really would like one minute because we are making an exception already in order to involve more participants. But I would like to hear more from our discussions as well. Olivia, to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Donato, and thank you all for the beautiful opening conversation, uh, which is uh, phenomenally challenging. Um, I, I wanted to start by reminding some of you discussed why we need this, right? And of course, asking why is the, is, is the fundamental root as to what we decide is a solution. Um, in my view, the why is very simply put as an ex the situation has of the systemic crisis has led us to an existential risk at this point. And I'm saying this to use an expression which I would like to bring ourselves to the very point where the, the urgency of change is clear. And I find existential risk to be a, a better expression than the long list of crises we have. Now, if we do have a situation, if we acknowledge that or we agree to that, and that's a big if in itself, then we can uh, look for solutions. But there is a premise also that I wanted to put here that I totally um, empathize with all the obstacles that you all see and the depth of them is, is incommensurable. Uh, just the idea and the dialogue on biocultural diversity that I have studied in some detail is just phenomenal expression of what we are faced with in terms of the, um, what we should probably say the opposition to any such plans. So the question I have is, as many other speaker um, um, listeners have already commented on, what about the weird and wonderful world we've lived in for a year, digital technology? What can that do to deliver a, and I think someone else also used the word prototype, <laughs> some sort of version of what we desperately need if we are indeed in existential risk status? that can deliver something that might either prompt the UN itself to move further and faster than it can for all the reasons that you know better than me, or in alternative exist in parallel. And my closing comment is, I was very struck two years ago at an OECD conference of national statisticians, over 3000 of them. And the question that apparently is not asked at all often to the people is what matters to them. And I wondered if that platform could only do one thing and deliver the succinct question of as many people as possible of what matters to them. So many of those phenomenally long list of items on the UN agenda would probably fall off or at least they would be more easily prioritized. Sorry, that's, um, I hope that was not too, too long a minute. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I see that now we still have Josep, Josep Gary, who asked to introduce himself and just to uh, uh, make really half, uh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds soundbite. That's all we can allow you. Unfortunately, Josep, we don't have time. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Donato. Thank you, everybody, for this effort to, to deal with this deficit of democracy in the world and in the UN. Uh, my, my comment and question I wanted to propose is that uh, in order to advance, one of the key elements of democracy is inclusion, is social inclusion. And uh, one of the best ways in the UN to make progress on things is to initiate with a small innovation that has an, an expansive potential. And here I want to introduce the idea, uh, and it's always the challenge, on how to move from stakeholders of governance to right holders. And I think this distinction could be very useful. And here I want to mention the case of indigenous peoples. Could we start thinking about UN governance with indigenous peoples as a starting point? I think, uh, Andreas, your second idea of an assembly could be a space for that dialogue. Just to start with us, because civil society has many interpretations. There are already spaces for civil society through the economic and social council to give ideas. But what about rights holders? those who have critical roles in global commons that are historically displaced, that have unique voices that are very different from the governance systems to have a particular space. And maybe we could start, and that's my suggestion, to think about the spaces of uh, deliberation 
with indigenous peoples. That can be the initial point. And here I want to mention another element, participation versus decision-making. That's the critical element. We could create spaces for participation, but the, ultimately the problem and the challenge is who decides, how we all decide collectively. I want to add that, that already in the UN, not in New York maybe because of all these structural complexities, but in countries, I have had the privilege to work with inclusive governance between governments and indigenous peoples to make together collective decisions. And it has worked. It's complicated, but it works. What can we do globally? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Joseph. I'm sorry if I have to cut you off, but we really have five minutes left. And uh, I would like to give the floor to David Chivaize and Jonathan Granoff next uh, to uh, just signify to us what is your takeaway point? What do you think we should be doing in order to foster these initiatives uh, and similar initiatives as we heard from Maria Spinoza uh, and the others who intervened in this debate? What is your takeaway point? Please, one minute each. Let's start with David, thank you. Okay. Um... I can't do that in one minute, but what I can do is leave, you know, two, three points to ponder, not necessarily how to proceed. Uh, although how to proceed, I already said, I think civil society in all its forms and in all its incarnations needs to act very forcefully with its own governments to uh, get their voice heard and to stop some of the, their own governments, uh, you know, marginalizing them. When you are respected and heard at home, you will be respected and heard internationally. That's how to proceed in my view. Uh, I would like to uh, commend uh, Ms. Um, uh, Al -Gindi, El Gindi, because I was itching to say this, that it is not, and everybody in all the chats and everywhere keeps saying, we the people, it is we the people's. And uh, those who are uh, mother tongue uh, English speakers will, will confirm uh, the, the difference here. Secondly, um, Security Council is unchangeable, I'm afraid, because it has to be changed by the members themselves. And that's not happening, okay? Uh, they've tried everything, there's an open-ended working group, it's not happening. Nobody's going to give up their seat. We already have two European countries sitting there. Uh, are they going to give it up for Brussels? And we continue with all the, um, the uh, continents. Same problem. However, UN Charter, I would like everyone to ask themselves, if we start fiddling with the UN Charter, do we have even a theoretical hope that we could come up with anything with, with a, a better charter or with anything resembling the charter? Or is it going to be an open-ended conversation discussion with the old charter not working and the new one unreachable? And if it is reachable, is it going to be a little booklet like this? Or is it going to be volumes of uh, verbosity and, uh, and uh, hot air. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Jonathan, what is your I think for us? It's very sobering to see that there are extremist nationalist movements bordering on straight up fascism in many of the prominent countries of the world today, the United States being one of them. Um, and then we have five aspiring empires uh, uh, presently before us, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. Then we have, we have global governance by market forces presently. I think, I think we have to recognize that we actually have a process in which individual agency is expressed through purchasing and, and identity. So that the problem we have is that our that we have governance, but it's governed by market, not by democracy and the voice of the people. And we have a distortion of the voice of the people in many prominent countries in which nationalism is taking priority over the reality of the modern age. And this is no one would have expected 
Big surprise, Brazil, Mexico, Poland, Hungary have these movements. No one would have expected this in the United States. And why was the UN created? It came out of the fight against racist, nationalist, fascist movements. And now we're facing this. On the other hand, there is a cosmopolitan class globally with tremendous sophistication, unprecedented in human history, that is emerging all over the world. I've been to universities in Russia, in China, all over the United States, Mexico, and seen this amazing intelligentsia capable, capable of communicating and addressing global problems and a level of sophistication that my generation could only dream of. The next generation is an evolutionary step. As we went from city states to nation states, we have to go to the global governance method. One of the things that I would just urge so strongly is that the United Nations start communicating its story, its principles, its values, its successes to the world. There are th it, the only time that I saw that happen was in the 1990s at the world summits that had massive civil society participation. The World Summit in Rio with the environment, the World Summit in Beijing on human rights and women, the World Summit on Habitat in Istanbul, the, the, the World Summit on Social Development in Copenhagen. There was full participation of civil society. And then those civil society movements went out to the public. And I would say the culmination of that was, thank God for Federico Mayer saying, listen, we're all we're talking about is a culture of peace. But that got diverted by 9-11. We've been fighting terrorism. That discussion, that process of an integrated human security agenda that addresses real human needs with real civic society participation, I believe the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, gives us the opportunity to reinvigorate that process. And I would say that the framework for doing that the framework for creating the demand for greater civil society participation is the human security agenda because the human security agenda focuses on human beings, not just states. And when we're talking about, when we're talking about creating a greater voice of the peoples in the United Nations system, there has to be that passion to address the whole human community the, the, and, and what, what is our common humanity. And right now, for the first time in human history, our common humanity is, is in front of the whole world. We, we have the mirror of it, and the pandemic has given us that mirror. So I think it's the time for this discussion at multiple levels, universities, think tanks, et cetera. And WASIS definitely has, uh, has enormous re intellectual resources. That's all we have, really intellectual resources to contribute to it. And I thank David for, you have to address the problems if you're gonna have reasonable solutions. So we need vision and we need to know what the problems are. Jonathan, thank you. I want to thank Andreas, first of all, for his time and patience with us. We, he was rather in a straight jacket, a limited time to, uh, to brief us on the three extremely valid initiatives with their own history, with a future, by the way, that we all support. And uh, you heard many uh, comments, uh, positive comments, encouraging comments, but also uh, critique in terms of uh, difficulties that you will have to surmount uh, throughout these proceedings. Uh, we also uh, heard so many other ideas along the same vein that we want to continue debating uh, through this series of World Academy uh, talks. This was uh, the first in a series. I understand that many of you, we had more than 60, 70 uh, fellows of the World Academy that uh, have been uh, following this discussion today. And among them, I just want to acknowledge Emil Constantinescu, former president of Romania, uh, Federico Maior, former uh, director general of UNESCO, and so many uh, others, uh, high level individuals. So thanks to all of you for listening in, for being patient. You would have so much to contribute, but we cannot do it today. We had 90 minutes. We want to maintain this format, more to come. Thank you very much.